Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to our webinar, Beyond the Hype, is uh, generative AI is actually ready for a finance. We are happy to have you, uh, you here and uh, <clears throat> let's together dive into details and discuss a uh, couple of topics that might be interesting uh, for you and to us as well. So we all like saw and we see like different articles and different things uh, flying here and there about uh, technology la landscape and how it's changing over time. And uh, right now it looks promising, but is it actually like Gen AI ready for finance uh, itself? Let's discuss. Today together, we're gonna like take you on a journey and uh, check uh, POCs and like practical examples of uh, what, what what we did uh, here in data art and what we can do. And uh, yeah, I'm not the only one here today and please welcome uh, Andrei Boldrev. Uh, hey, Andrew, and Dmitry Baikov. Guys, maybe a quick round table, a couple of words about yourself uh, because uh, before we dive into details. Yeah, let me start. So name's Andrei, uh, I'm a product manager and a solution consultant in finance practice for many years. I'm uh, focusing on a uh, wide variety of finance um, departments or areas like uh, compliance, payments, uh, trades, uh, risk assessment. Uh, however, well, it was quite a big surprise for me why my colleagues uh, uh, have invited me on this uh, webinar. Because, well, I'm uh, really skeptical about uh, the artificial intelligence in, gen in general. I honestly never used ChatGPT yet uh, because, well, I don't really believe uh, it's quite secure yet. And so maybe this webinar would answer some of my uh, personal questions I have collected for last year and uh, maybe some of yours. Yeah, Dmitry, over to you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Andrei. My name is Dmitry. I'm working as a technical director at AML here in DataArt. So we are doing a lot of interesting projects and we are happy to break your understanding what is possible and impossible with AI. So today I'll be happy to dive into finance and show a couple of our use cases and explain how we do POCs there and what are the things which are really working for years already. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Dmitry. Thank you, Andrea. So, guys, I think let's let's dive into details and uh, see see what you got, Dmitry. As the floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you very much. So, uh, I have a quick deck for approximately fifteen slides. So, let's start from the second one. And uh, what I wanted to bring the light uh, that actually machine learning in finance, it's it's quite a live uh, industry. And in data art, we are doing machine learning for the last 10 years. And you see a couple of examples of what we did as a company for different clients in different, uh, in different um, uh, countries and in different cities, uh, different size of organizations. And we started from, you know, all, all the range of cases, starting from on default prediction, customer churn prediction, uh, some financial assets classification, and finishing the uh, forecasting of the sales revenue prediction, some optimizations on the client onboarding side in commodities prices, and also fraud detection and uh, outlier detection, which is very important topic for transactional uh, banking industry and uh, all other trading activities as well. So we, we have a wide range of use cases which are mostly targeted at optimization, at routine optimization, at revenue optimization, workforce optimization, and that's why machine learning exists overall. So this is mostly re related to tabular data, to natural language processing and computer vision. So that's what was uh, also touched by generative AI, but actually tabular data is one of the things which is untouched and which can be solved using uh, uh, using uh, algorithms which are there in place for four years and uh, even before like uh, production implementation they were there from mathematical side but one thing I want to mention and I want to like dive deeper on this webinar it's financial document processing so this is very huge domain as we see in data art and a lot of we see that a lot of clients wants to adapt it even if they don't 
know it, we see that they have the benefits of adoption of intelligent document processing. So this is a huge sphere of automating, handling and management electronic documents and actually physical documents as well. And it's all about how to recognize the data from scanned images, from emails, uh, Word documents, PDF documents, and what to do with this data. So it will bring you the benefits for your business. You can, and the benefits actually are, it's streamlining workflow or increasing efficiency. It's it's all about saving the costs and better customer experience but but also on the other side it's structuring the unstructured data where you can build analytics on top of it when you can show the people what's inside there what's inside this huge amount of emails you have how can we build statistics on top of it how can we extract the main entities in, inside it how can we classify these documents and what should we do after that so it this this uh, structurization and intelligent document processing gives huge benefit just to start just to build on top of it for the future machine learning projects and and that's what what is really a complex process so starting from the data ingestion where you gather the data you understand your data sources you understand which type of data sources you have if you you have images, you need to dive into image processing with OCR techniques and extract the text first, extract the structure, extract the tables, and only then move further into applying machine learning techniques to classify the document. It may be doc different document types, like we have a contract, we have agreements, we have policies, so we need to classify them. And we also need to extract the data out of it. So we may find some entities or names, and we may find some dates, so it's all about getting more structure out of these documents. So you may have documents of 100 pages, but what you really need to know whether they're signed or not. And for that, you need a human to check it. But with all this flow and plus validation with human in the loop and like light integration into different production environments, you can give bring more value into different departments starting HR and support and finishing your development departments as well, departments as well. And, and this delivery, this last stage, it's one of the most important. So how do you integrate to which, to which data format you will convert and how you will transfer this knowledge, transfer this structure inside, inside your organization. But overall, the, the workflow is like that and it's a great image uh, to, to visualize that. And actually, we, we see uh, this use case so often that we developed our own accelerator for doing that inside ATART. So it doesn't mean that it solves a lot of different things, but it's a great foundation uh, for us to start when we see such projects. So we can uh, go to production faster, we can get the results faster, and this solution supports both OCR and both uh, NLP techniques, which I mentioned before. Again, it's just to visualize that we have a lot of experience with that, and we see that it, this is what industry really dictates as, as a need. You can find more details on our website with a great pro promo video if you if you want. But also, as I said, the scans are a real problem here. So it's not about uh, how we analyze the text, but it's also about how we get the data, textual data from images. And tables are really a complex structure to uh, extract the data from because it's an image, it's a scan, it has its own format. And you can see on this slide that how, how complex and how uh, much data you can get out of this processing with the tooling which we, for instance, developed. And as you see, it may require different uh, document types, it may require validation, it will have some errors, but eventually you will have 80 to 90 percent of the text you have on a slide with the structure itself. So it, it's good It's good to understand what capabilities there is, uh, there are here in, uh, in, in this space. And it's, on, it's only before generative AI, but if, if we go deeper, again, this is industry uh, which this is an industry uh, cases we had, and this is what we see. And again, it's even before generative AI. So we'll dive into generative AI in a couple of later slides. But again, it's just to see for you to see how how impactful it is. And for instance, we did a project for a big financial institution. The problem was that they have a complex, time-consuming process for manual document review, 
and we got the benefits that we improved operational efficiency and overall we speed up the document review process by up to 80 percent and again this again this is working without generative ai and but you need some some good team in place and the timeline would be quite big to to get this project rolling and if we speak about generative AI solutions and what they bring to to this problem we can see that the, the difference and the impact it give it gave immediately. So we we are working uh, in different domains with generative AI solutions. We, we did a bunch of PLC on different cloud tech stacks and technologies. And we started from uh, code generation and knowledge-based chatbots and email intent detection. So all bunch of uh, how to uh, bring more value to support teams, how to bring more value to developers, how to get easy and fast access to your knowledge with the chatbots. But, but document processing has also quite good improvements uh, comparing to what we had. So now we, we are pretty open to asking the questions to the documents. We are pretty confident in that we can define the sentiment or emotions from the document. We can extract the entities even better if we will just describe these instructions by text, we can get a POC rolling not in three months, not with the clouds, you know, but just with within a couple of weeks within our small team uh, inside the organization. We can do a summary and key points from the documents as well. So it gives us much more benefits and much more features we may use uh, just from the generative AI itself. And again, there is a lot of services right now in the space. Uh, of course, OpenAI and Azure OpenAI services are one of the first, but currently there are open source models as well. Uh, Google Cloud and AWS has a great offerings as well with AWS Bedrock and Google Cloud uh, Palm API, which, which gives you an access to build the uh, to build the um, solutions inside your infrastructure on premise, both on premise and clouds, do not depend on, on OpenAI or Azure itself. But of course, like Azure OpenAI is a good model. It has a great benchmarks, and, but now all of the uh, compet competitors are getting to the same, pretty similar stage. Uh, and again, conversational search or chatbots, uh, all of these use cases are also available on all of these uh, on all of these platforms and image generation as well. So here is the point that there are a lot of generative AI applications on different technologies. And just an example, uh, one of the POCs we did for real estate client, they have these types of uh, documents inside. This is like uh, advertisements about the uh, real estate and we have some uh, addresses, we have some pricing, we have some uh, contact information and even descriptions so we can extract the entities from that. But the most important thing that as soon as you have only one, only one document, you already go and start building and you may have not the best accuracy, but you can tune it later. So your role to POC are much slower than doing that in, in, in the with NLP technologies from, from previous, because it's large language model, it is trained on the whole internet plus proprietary data sets. That's why it has this knowledge. It understands what does it mean to be an advertisement? What does it mean to be a real estate? What is address? What is US? So it understands a lot of concepts. That's why it's easier for this model to extract this data without pre-training. But of course you can, you can train it and you can fine tune that and uh, make even better results. The other POC we did on the financial data, just to come back to finance, uh, we extracted the liabilities and extracted entities out of table, again, with generative AI. So this one was a bit more complex since we need to do uh, OCR and tables extraction. Uh, but afterwards, we got the liabilities, for instance, object, which represents in any format you, you want, like Excel, CSV, and JSON, uh, your table so you can build reports on top of that you can do analytics you can uh, work with this data you know it's not an image which is unstructured so it's a generative ai gives you easily ability and i'm talking about uh, text generation models right now gives you an ability to make it faster and make it accurate as well so both about speed and accuracy so what what generative AI opens for us in, in specifically document space and finance? 
uh, do faster classification pro problems, classify your documents to different formats, make a document summarization. If you have 100 page document, but you really need like three, uh, three lines, three sentences, text generative models can help you. Key points, keywords and contracts extraction, that's all possible as well. Uh, and answering questions, which was quite important quite hard to do before, but it opens us a huge range of capabilities by indexing a lot of documents. We create, can create a chatbot and we can ask the questions in our show demo very soon where, where you will see how it exactly works. Plus sentiment analysis and emotion detection. If you want to go deeper to your data, you can extract sentiment per sentence or per abstract, per document or per page, per email. So it's all available without any additional tooling except one single API call to, op uh, to, to generative AI model. And aspects and entity recognition goes out of the box as well. So you can extract entities and you can extract things like dates, names, etc. So imagine you can do all of these features in just one API call. So that's what generative AI brings to you. Before it was a model per, per the case, but now you can basically do it inside one, inside one request, about one email, you can do all of that. About one document, you can send a couple of requests, like one request per page, and you can get the same. So it gives us huge range of opportunities and ap applications without even having like data science team in place. So only with engineering skills and with within proper security in place, it gives you uh, best best combination. So let's dive into demo and I'll show you one of the prototypes we developed before. So this is simple UI and you can see that we, we are working here with some document which actually represents healthcare insurance uh, information. And there are a lot of information about your premiums, how to change the class, so huge document, like not huge, but 13 page document, which you need to read to understand. So what I will do, I will just upload this document to one of the our POCs we did in past. And I will ask the questions to this document. And actually I will, I have already pre-built three questions. And these are how to change your insurance class, how to understand when my insurance begins and what should I do in case of emergency. So these all are important client facing questions, but also from the other side, from the other support side, they, they can help to serve clients better and they can help to understand internal documentation and policies better. So let's see how it works. And um, we have the answers uh, pretty quickly and I'll just download and wrap it in, in more uh, like wider space. But as you can see, we have our three questions and we have answers in place, which are actually like a pieces of text out of our document, which gives us the information about what we actually ask. So about how to change insurance class, it says this text does not provide information on how to change insurance class, but you may submit a written request to change your insurance class and people can help you. And on the last one, in case of emergency, we see that there is actually a phone number and there are some addresses or websites. So basically this is the information we can lift and uh, we can move forward with that. So what if we can have an automatically generated email or, or summary of our conversation and send this to our support agent so we'll see what, what exactly is uh, happening with this specific person, what is the request? Or we can give only the phone number as a result so it's totally tunable up to your uh, business needs. But it's just to demonstrate that it gathers the data out of different, uh, different parts of the document and it gives us you know, in-depth look without reading this document, like from start to beginning. So this is just one of the examples from insurance, from healthcare. Let's go into something more finance and let's see this electricity account uh, bill. And as you see, it's like a scan. I cannot just copy paste something out of it. So I have a couple of prices and total amounts with discounts and without discounts. So basically, tables and you know not not normal uh, scan i would say so it's a bit shifted towards left so what i'm doing here i'm using in in the background uh, ocr technique uh, you can use any from from the clouds from the open source as well but just to show how it looks like after ocr it's a txt file with pretty 
unusual, uncomfortable format, so you cannot read it. It's not structured, but it gives all the text what's inside this document. And it opens, opens us the opportunities to build something with generative AI on top of this document. So let's do the same within the same prototype and copy paste this text and ask different questions to this document. And again, these questions may be in text format and these questions may be just return me one price. And that's what we are going to do here. So I have a couple of them uh, which ask, uh, what is the total due amount? What, what's the total due amount with discount? And what's the address? Because it's, it's one of the things we, we want to find out of this scan and this PDF file. So in short time, we are getting the total amount and total amount with discount. So it understands that these things are different and system is not fine tuned for these specific types of the documents. It can parse basically any type of document with your questions. And it also gives you the address as well. But what I'll do next, I have the separate text and voice and I have separate bill, like totally different format with total due as well, with a number and with Oh, of course, the address since it's utility bill. So what I'll do next, I'll do the same OCR within the same tooling and getting the same TXT file within unusual format and structured. I'll copy paste it and I will not change the questions. So the questions will remain the same because it's the same type of document. We want to parse this data from different type of contract, that's it. So we still want to have total due amount, total due amount with discount and the address. So. In a couple of seconds, you will see that we still have total due amount, the correct price. And the system says there is no total due amount with discount. So it understands that there is not there is no uh, this amount in, in, in data. So it can also like skip it if needed. It will not invent the new date for the new price for you. It, since it's not there in the document. And it says, yeah, your address is this one. So again, different document, but the same idea behind that. So that's just for you to understand what, what are the capabilities right now of generative AI. This POC can be done in like pretty quick terms with your data, like up to two months for data in integration. And like, just a couple of weeks are needed to validate this idea and to get the first insights. So let's come back to the presentation. And I just want to speak a bit more about uh, compliance and security since it's very, very important topic here in finance as well. So I want to say that we are not using OpenAI platform for building our POCs. We are not using ChatGPT. And there is a separation between client-facing products like ChatGPT, BART, and uh, Hugging Face Chat, and uh, and B2B products, because on cl client-facing products, they say, yeah, we may train for your data, we may take a look at your data. It's not secure to build a solutions with that. But the same OpenAI models are available inside Microsoft Azure, and it's the same models with the same billing, but with all uh, security and compliance we have on Azure. So your security and compliance team can validate the documents, can validate how they approach data retention. And actually the retention is only 30 days for Microsoft Azure. And in 30 days, no one can look at your data except some abuse monitoring uh, cases. But if you want to move to production, there are also a capabilities that Microsoft provides, which gives you the opt-in out of your logging request and response. So which means that no one will have an access to your data and your res response request will not be stored anywhere. So Google Cloud and Amazon has their own policies in that space as well. So again, you need to write it, you need to read it very carefully and understand how it works. And if still it's not the case, there are open source models which are also getting each day better and better Due to latest release, the model Llama 2 from Facebook, it got really great and comparable to GPT 3.5. So with these types of models, you can deploy them on premise, on your private hosting environment, on in your or in your cloud environment without using this as a service, and use these models as you were building like simple uh, API service. So it's pretty available right now. There is no like blockers for uh, compliance and security from as we see, but it's important to keep that in mind and each use case validate with your teams and ask to explain how it works within your uh, engineering departments as well. 
So this is pretty it from my side. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Dmitry. It was fantastic. Uh, yeah, guys, we are now in a Q&A mode, guys. Uh, we have some topics to discuss and we want to discuss it with you. But meanwhile, feel free to drop a messages in the chat uh, and we will be happy to like, answer all of them. On that note, uh, Andrew, let's, uh, let's kick off. Yeah, absolutely. I'm waiting for this. So let me start from more uh, generic question. Uh, so um, many years ago uh, on my iPhone 5, I seen uh, Siri for the first time. And uh, right now everybody knows about Siri, Alexa and similar um, helpers, as I would say. However, in like many years, I never considered Siri as something intelligent. So I kind of uh, don't really believe it is. However, last couple of years, something has changed and uh, we see ChatGPT version two, now it's version four. And it's like somebody says it's like a 30 years old um, human being. So like what happened in last two years? Uh, why it, uh, it didn't appear earlier than that? So do you know, Dmitry? Yeah, sure. So uh, let me decompose these questions. Uh, previously, uh, Siri and Alexa, they were, they were built like a chatbot. So basically, they have a tree of responses plus some parts of machine learning, which they can answer to you. So they are not generative models. They do not invent. They have some pre-built replies, and they can work with you on your problems within your space of problems. But what is different that Machine learning evolved, and there were much big, big improvements on how to train models, how to like in in um, in uh, processors, in GPU, in CPU as well. So basically, now you have new approaches how to build bigger and more clever models, which can explain you something from the core of their nature. So it's not something pre-built and it's not some if else plus machine learning. It's basically the, the model and which saw the whole internet, which saw all the articles on Wikipedia. It doesn't mean that it understands the facts. It doesn't mean that it cannot imagine something new, but it, it only means that it understands a lot of concept and it works like I saw on the internet that this question is answered like that. And statistically, we answer it, it's model, this model answers in that way. So if you ask what is the capital of Great Britain, it says that, yeah, the capital of Great Britain is London, but it's only because it saw that it's the most common request on the internet. And that's what it sees inside their training data. So that's why I would say it's a number of, uh, it's a number of things that changed, but Couple of things are the most important. It's new uh, machine, it's new neural network architectures, and the cloud technology and the processors which lets us to train this type of models become so they do not have intelligence by their own, but since they like trained and they are educated on a lot of things, they can answer in that regards very well. Okay. All right. Clear. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, we have a couple of, of questions in uh, from from the audience, so let's start. Uh, Dmitry, can you talk about prompt engineering, please? Yeah, sure. So uh, prompt engineering is is a door to using uh, text generation models. So uh, it's it's the new domain, the new sphere of uh, how to describe your problem better. It, rather how to code your problem in, in, in the code like Python and .NET. So it, the, it, there are a couple of great uh, documents and a couple of great studies and articles in the internet how to do prompt engineering. Uh, you, can, you need to explain your problem very carefully. You need to say how you want the model to perform, whether you want to perform as a special marketing specialist or some dotnet engineer you can set the roles you can show the examples how you want the answer to be shaped so if you are generating sql code just give a couple of examples how you want to sh to see this code if you are doing the summary of the document just give a couple of examples of the summary summary in this specific document so it will understand and be tuned for your model and also uh, experiment with prompting 
you have a lot of different options. You have a lot of different phrases. Sometimes you need just to replace something. Sometimes you need more structure inside the prompt. Uh, try to describe your problem in the beginning, then give the examples and then show what do you want to do. So actually it helps. It's a matter of uh, like data science and data analysis, but mostly it's, it's a huge domain with a great uh, with a great uh, in improvements like chain of thought approach, for instance, where you can build your prompts not in a way that you have only request response pairs, but also you can build your prompt as system and in that way that you set more high level goal and set the tools for your LLM. Like for instance, I have this API to connect. This API gets you the list of products. And actually the model itself can in chain, in chain of thoughts, generate what it needs to do. So in some cases it will hit the API. In some cases it will just get you something out of its knowledge. So it's, it's all about different approaches and how you work with that, how you uh, help this model to reflect, to retrospect, and how you describe your task. But uh, I would recommend you checking a lot of uh, great courses on Coursera and uh, OpenAI documentation for more details on specific prompting examples. Thank you so much. Uh, let's move on. Uh, we briefly touch base this question, but yeah, let, let's repeat. Which departments or processes within a organization are the best suited for AI implementation to bring uh, significant benefits? Maybe like a couple of them. Not, so, not Andre, do you have yeah. do you have any any ideas on these departments and use cases? Uh, yeah, in finance, uh, usually uh, companies are structured in in a way of departments if you could call it. So, for example, operational department responsible for like uh, payments, fra uh, trades, uh, fraud, put, verification of the balances, accounting departments for finance, uh, compliance, uh, obviously responsible for um, uh, KYC onboarding process, um, underwriting for credits and so on and so forth. So these type of departments, I'm, I'm guessing because it's not my question, but um, probably the, it would hint you uh, like uh, what, what to answer. And don't forget a HR department. Every yeah. company might have one. Yeah, so my, my, my question was mostly on the, in the use cases side, but okay, let me try to uh, generate some of, of the cases we, we can do. Uh, we, we are doing our own research inside data arts as an organization where we can bring more value inside different departments. And for instance, for HR recruitment, uh, we saw the value in uh, doing something with, uh, like with the data, maybe with CVs or maybe with something else. So it seems like there is a huge potential in, in processing the documents and getting the data inside HR recruitment. Uh, so you, you need to see your specific use case in, in support automation as well. So if you have support, you uh, we, we did a POC for a travel company which uh, wanted to increase their support uh, speed and increase their uh, benefits from support. So we did for them a, a great tool which classified the input emails to its intent and then it extracts the data and generates a follow-up email automatically so support agents spend less time on creating these responses understanding what is needed for the request and spending more time on actions rather than getting this information so there are a lot of applications and uh, inside inside your uh, I don't know, customer department. The, it depends on your product. You can predict the revenue per customer. You can predict clicks per customer. So uh, it's 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 the whole range of use cases. So the use cases I described in the beginning, they totally works with that. They totally work with that. But uh, again, it depends on your, uh, on your structure. Well, I could give you one uh, example from compliance. For example, Quite a lot of efforts and uh, resources uh, companies spend for onboarding processes for uh, their clients, uh, companies or individuals. And uh, one of the checks are um, so-called OFAC check or um, uh, sanction check, as well as uh, PEP check, which is publicly exposed person. So for example, if uh, my new client and the name uh, Osama Bin Laden, which should surprisingly is quite popular name, However, well, it's still a human area where to understand, is it like our um, 
uh, Osama bin Laden or the one which he, uh, is in uh, sanction lists. So uh, you mentioned uh, artificial intelligence learns by quite a big amount of data, including fresh data from internet, including maybe articles, news. So can artificial intelligence help here? Uh, and instead of human made a decision, is uh, our uh, private individual, Osama bin Laden, the right one, uh, the law bidding uh, citizen, or a, do a dodgy, well, the one who is in sanction list. So is it kind of a case for finance? Yeah, so exactly. I, I would not say that it's more about fraud detection or outliers detection. So I would not say that we need generative AI to resolve this use case. So there are techniques which are working for fraud detection, like the models which were there in place for years. And of course, it can help you to detect the, the, the biases, to detect the outliers, to work with your data uh, like better to understand the quality. Generative AI on the other side can help you to explain these decisions. So in case you have uh, like this Osama bin Laden, you know, and it shows you somehow on outlier side because of the mess, you can you can have your own small uh, chat GPT, not chat GPT, but generative AI model, which trained and fine tuned exactly to explain why this user or this client seems to be like like fraudulent why these transactions seem to be fraudulent so it gives you more human understanding and more human explanation in that terms but it's a combination of classical machine learning algorithms and generative ai which can be there in place perfect that's exactly what needed oh. because for compliance department explanation should be attached to any uh similar case yeah thank you yeah thank you guys uh, we have a bunch of uh, questions let's move on uh, we want to uh, answer everything like possible so next one uh, how do you deal with hallucinations of the model i noticed your chat said i don't have enough information when it couldn't answer the question yeah so uh, this one is pretty similar uh, pretty simple uh, sorry uh, i just explicitly wrote in prompt when we were building this application that if there is no answer to the question then answer no information present so this like trick which is very simple gives you an opportunity to fight these hallucinations so it's one of the tricks which of course you may have more but uh, this is the simplest one. Work with your prompts to get better visibility of what you expect from the model. If you do not expect anything, just say it explicitly. That's number one. Number two, limit, uh, limit the data and give more data for the context of the model. So if you are working with specific documents, do not ask to uh, do not ask the questions which model might not know, but rather give it the context, give it the document, give it a piece of text where this knowledge may be inside. So it's pretty good at getting the information out of text, but it's pretty bad at uh, inventing the information when you don't need it. So it's, you know, it's, it's something like that. Uh, that's why ex explore different techniques. Try all you can. Uh, work with your prompt and uh, add more context to the model to your prompt basically all right thank you next one have you worked with lotus nodes and domino uh, so we we are partners with domino data lab if that's the the question uh, we we are working with their uh, MLOps capabilities and exploring their other capabilities as well. So for, for Lotus, I cannot comment since I'm not familiar with this uh, company, but uh, for Domino Labs, uh, yes, we, we have uh, expertise and partnership with them. So we are working with them for, for a couple of years right now uh, within MLOps space. All right, hope this answers the question. Uh, uh, next one, have you tried to fine tune any models for a, a financial domain? Any accuracy, feedback, uh, price or performance? Yeah, I can comment on the Bloomberg GPT uh, model, which is like a huge deal in, uh, in the finance sector. And I think a couple of days ago, there was a 
podcast of the guy who was building this model and he was explaining all of the technical details they uh, they uh, <laughs> bring there so actually it was 512 uh, SageMaker instances working in parallel to train this model for like 30 days at least I think it was 48 days and the investment only in 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 this uh, was more than 1 million uh, dollars and there was a team who was working on that so you can imagine this huge investment so the final thought of the podcast was probably we would need to explore fine-tuning more before doing the same in future so answering your question <laughs> we are experimenting with fine-tuning as well we have a couple of experience with gpt3 even before gpt3.5 and 4 came out and for the finance data we, we worked a lot in, in building machine learning models like from NLP side before, before Generative AI came in. And now we have a separate research project on experimenting how to fine tune open source models on, on all of the cloud platforms. That, that's currently what we are doing. And financial data is included there as well. Just because we have this experiment with Bloomberg GPT, we have the metrics and we have the, the result and now this podcast, which clears up uh, some things there. But... Uh, the answer to your question, yes. And f we are starting usually from prompt engineering. Then we add indexing. And then we add a couple of more context into the prompt and build some system on, based on your knowledge. And only then we go to fine tuning the model if it's needed. And like training from zero, it is not the re usual request right now from the clients because we have a lot of tools which we can work with right now on the market. Uh, that's why answering to your question, yes, we have an experiment. Uh, uh, but now the clients are mostly exploring this space yet. Thank you so much. Uh, next one. How effective is AI in forecasting and risk assessment? Could you please explain the methods and the mechanism it uses to perform these tasks? Yeah, so... Uh... Again, this, this question is for me goes into uh, like table data and forecasting that was possible before the uh, generative AI, but uh, there are uh, a number of uh, techniques, uh, for instance, profit uh, model from the Facebook, which does pretty well this forecasting and the uh, Arima models and a lot of a lot more like neural networks are pretty good in that as well. Uh, deep neural networks like transformers and all of these. All of these are the solutions you need to try on your data to see the model accuracy on your specific data on the forecast. Do you want to forecast one year or three days or one hour? It also depends on, on your accuracy. The longer you want to forecast, uh, the more data we have, the better, uh, the better results for the more data and the worse results for longer forecast. So this is what's already working. Uh, for accuracy, uh, it depends on your data. Uh, sometimes it's, it, it may be good, sometimes you don't have enough data, you need to gather more, sometimes you need to select a different model, but again, it's if you have the data, usually we set up a POC in data, art. it's like four to eight weeks, and we explore your data, we uh, give our insights and our feedback, we train basic models, and if you want to forecast, you will see like preliminary metrics, and you can decide later whether you want to move to production and integrate, or you want to finish this research. So we are doing a lot of these POCs, and like forecasting in finance and in retail uh, is, is quite often a request from our clients. Cool. Uh, next one. Uh, how can I input spreadsheet data such as list of transactions for a month into the AI system for analysis? List of transactions data. So uh, you you can do a, a number of tricks. Uh, first of all, if um, the, the biggest model right now, it's a cloud model, which has 100K context, which is pretty big, like 75,000 words, and it can work with like this limited uh, limited data. So ChatGPT is limited right now, I believe, to 16K symbols, which is roughly 14,000 words, which is pretty big as well. But usually it's something there. From 4,000 4, 4, words to 75,000 words, if your data set can be like plugged in, you can ask the questions, you can upload the data, you can ask to explain, and all of that. If it does not, if it is, does not uh, like goes into that space, you can aggregate your data. You can subtract a piece of your data. You can make it 
uh, you can make it available only for you know sm a small bunch of transactions or a small bunch of your documents and work with that and as soon as it works or not works it will give you more clarity of what you are trying to find because usually it depends on your request if you want to build a plot for instance on the whole of your data you may just need the code and you can run this code on offline in your data so it depends on your use case for the documents there is a great trick called indexing so basically there are currently the approaches which where you can index thousands and hundreds of thousands of the documents and ask the questions as i did in my demo but to the bunch of documents conferences pdfs emails all of that can can go into this uh, system uh, same as microsoft uh, copilot uh, provides as well so for the documents is is pretty solved question for for the table or data there is no like great solution right now uh, with generative ai can like help so that's why classical machine learning is pretty pretty often used in finance still and will be i believe in future in nearest future at least so it cannot it right. cannot very well uh, forecast as well so uh, one more point on this if you're speaking i saw the comparison between ChatGPT in forecasting and revenue prediction and classical machine learning models. So it still happened that classical machine learning models can predict the numbers better based on the math inside than text generative uh, networks uh, because they are trained to predict the next word, not the number. So it's, it's very important to understand that probably for classification, yes, but for revenue prediction, it's still like twice or a, a bit more worse than uh, classical algorithms. Yeah, so it basically like depends on your needs and your tasks. All right, okay. sounds good. Uh, next one, does it have possibility to provide references to the pieces of docu documents, pages, sections, paragraphs, and so on and so forth? Yes, it's a great question. And we are working right now on one of the POCs which has this uh, as a requirement. So they want uh, to have a solution which provides them the sources for uh, the data, for the insights. And we are currently in progress of building one. We, we have a good progress with that. And our goal is to not only show the paragraph, but also show the lines and highlight the sentences and uh, lines in, in the paragraph, which relates to this, to this question and to the answer for that question. So to answer your question, it's even possible to go deeper to the uh, sentences level and to the phrases level rather than just the paragraph. So uh, sending up the paragraph is is pretty straightforward task uh, for for this type of uh, solutions. It, it goes right. out Thank of the so box. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, at this point, guys, we don't have questions from the chat. So yeah, feel free to ask more. We have uh, some time left, but we Maybe Andrew, you, you have another one. Another yeah, uh, while we're waiting, so I have two questions. One uh, is quick one and another one is rather long. So on one of the slides, you mentioned about document processing ac accelerator. Um, is it free of charge as many of our uh, accelerators we provide for our clients? Yeah, exactly. So uh, we, we use accelerators to move faster and uh, bring the client faster to the market. That's why we have a set of tools which we can reuse for specific use cases, which gives us uh, more value in building the POCs and focusing on, on the problem itself, on production implementation, on the product side. Uh, that's why, yes, the data art is not uh, developing the products but we have a lot of different POCs and uh, IPs uh, inside in AI specifically, which can help you to move faster. So all of these POCs I demonstrated that they, they can be reusable, uh, tuned for your needs, and the kickoff for the project would be much, much faster uh, for, for, for these use cases. So if I were a client and want to start uh, a new project in uh, using generative AI, all I need is to ask, can I use this accelerator to speed up development? Exactly, exactly. So we, we will have uh, one teammate who can uh, bring it to speed uh, with your data and you'll have this uh, pretty similar UI and working POC uh, relatively fast. Perfect. Yeah, okay. And a long one. It seems like it, uh, uh, we have uh, seen similar in the chat. So it's regarding security. You mentioned for custom solutions uh, using open source uh, AI, you have some controls which could limit uh, like the data exposed to other sources. 
However, what if I uh, were to use OpenAI from uh, Microsoft or similar from Google? Like uh, as a client, I usually have to submit my client's data, which is my main possession. It's my money, technically. How can I guarantee this won't be leaked, won't be uh, available to somebody, well, maybe even from Microsoft, since I, I maybe don't trust them entirely. So are there any, I don't know, uh, safeguards or doors uh, making me at least feel secure? Yeah. So uh, if you are on Azure, you can understand the level of security this platform provides, because if you store your client database there, it, that's the same. If you store your uh, API there that's the same if you're using the, their services like image generation not image generation text generation but most image generation as well uh, some some ml services or services like azure devops it all stores some of your data so with open ai it's the same case so it's b2b product for integration into your solutions and that's why they have a separate layers of internal security as the azure platform and you have an access to all of security features which you can have as a client of Azure platform. If you want to do white IP white listing, okay. If you want to log your data, okay. So all of that stuff is available with a different Azure services which are on the platform. And for data storage and retention policies, as I said, they have a pretty uh, great guides and explanations how they uh, store and not store your data. And uh, they are pretty open for uh, security experts consultancy as well. So. If if you have helps and your compliance team have any questions, you can reach out to them and they can handle that. So uh, usually you can go all the way through, I believe it, and to a consultation with Microsoft experts from Asia. Right, cool. Thank you, guys. And we have more questions from the chat. Thank you, guys. Uh, you're so active today. So uh, this is an interesting one. Did you see a recent analysis of chat? Uh, the chat GPT is becoming less effective as more data gets uploaded and uh, what do you expect from gpt5 yeah it's a good question well uh less effective uh that's really the case i saw some research uh, which says that it becomes like more stupid i've not tried though the same comparison on azure open ai services i'm not sure that it became like worse because it would be really strange if you integrate it into your product and it became worse. So I, I believe if it was the use case, no one would integrate and it went public very fast. So again, ChatGPT is a different product of OpenAI, which is not related to Azure OpenAI services for B2B integration. So I cannot guarantee that your data will not be used for research. I cannot guarantee that ChatGPT will become more stupid. I cannot guarantee which even version, version of the model you are using. Maybe they trained something yesterday and they are doing a bit testing on us. No one knows. Uh, that's why like, I'm not sure. It may be the case. But what I expect from GPT-5, I expect multi-modality. This is what really uh, is the next step when you can send the picture to OpenAI. And I was saying, not, not OpenAI, to ChatGPT. I was mentioning that, and there are some features in preview like that, but imagine that you are not, you are not need to do OCR on your documents. So you just send the picture to OpenAI services and you already can ask the questions to it. So this is no OCR uh, approach, which I believe would be a part of next uh, models and ChatGPT as well as a product and vice versa. Can it generate a plot? Can it generate an image? So it, it seems like this system would be a bit more complicated with different models inside. And uh, it will be as a solution for working with multi-modalities, with the code, with the images, with videos, and doing that for input and output. And for the text generation, so I believe that um, it would become more strict in terms of what it can work with, how it can generate, how it can speak with, with people. And GPT-5 will be rather not bigger and more performant, but rather more stable in terms of like compliance and security and all of the integrations. So that's my point that uh, Sam Altman said that there is no sense of building 
bigger models. And there are rumors that GPT-4 are like a set of eight smaller GPT models. So and had meta learner outside. So uh, let's see how it goes. Yeah, agree. Let's see. So we have one more question and one comment. Uh, we are we have five minutes, exactly five minutes. So uh, can you just repeat, Dmitry? Does my data get sent to uh, OpenAI if I'm on Azure OpenAI? So your data is not sent to OpenAI if you are using Azure OpenAI services. Your data goes to Microsoft, who serves the same models due to their agreement with OpenAI. So at, it's the same right. if you would like to host your application in Azure. It's the same. OpenAI is used there for branding and for partnership, uh, showing that they are partners, not for sending them the data. Thank you. And uh, last comment, and uh, on that note, I want to wrap up in a couple of minutes. So fast moving forward on Gen AI is what I take home. And uh, like I have a question, and let's let's briefly like discuss this thing. So right now, as we know, like finance, insurance inside of as part of finance is like really conservative uh, domains, right? And they like it's hard to adapt, right? We have like doses of like Excel files, outdated processes, but they are working, right? They're working fine. But what if I don't want to use this more than chat GPT AI stuff and I want to use my, my old school but again great working solution right now because we see like for example if you're talking about insurance lemonade they did their like claim with AI for just two seconds right AI opened like new opportunities for for like C3 right and new new like markets and new things and new business so it wasn't possible or like it was hard to do before like implementing actual AI. So my question to you guys, what what like is your feeling? What if I as a company or as a business, I don't want to like uh, go with like trends and uh, uh, do my internal POCs or whatever, what was going to happen? Andre, do you want to start? Well, uh, it's difficult uh, for me because, well, I'm not that deep in this area. However, uh, previous cases, uh, specifically when challenging banks start to using open banking API, I, I do recall uh, the conversations in the year like, oh, no, uh, all, all the banks, we are quite secure. We can survive. It's something which is... Uh, but right now, uh, count how many people using Revolut, Monzo, and similar challenging banks. And uh, positions of uh, big banks uh, are really kind of uh, under question mark right now. So I won't be surprised if new technologies uh, could challenge even more these positions. So that's, I'm not a forecaster. Uh, I can't envision what happens next but clearly something in the year. Yeah, uh, from my standpoint, uh, like from technology side, it seems like we are ready for implementing POCs and solutions. That's what we see on our client side. We have a lot of clients from finance, which are doing both classical machine learning and generative AI uh, document processing as well. So my recommendation would be just to try to understand what use cases you have, try to brainstorm and try to select top three of them and maybe consider doing one of the quick short discovery POCs for four weeks investment and see how it will help you. So my recommendation is to select low hanging fruit like document processing or like some forecasting, which will definitely help you to improve your business, business metrics and uh, like remove routine and then extend if, you, if needed and if you see the traction. But my point is just to start experimenting right now. All right, got you. Thank you, guys. So on that note, I would like to thank you all for attending. It was, it was amazing. If you have any more questions, please contact us. You can do it uh, by email, aiml at datar.com, or feel free to contact us on LinkedIn, drop us a message, 
and let us know about next topic we should highlight for you guys. See you soon. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you.